In this video, we're going to practice applying the concepts that we learned in the previous video on the Michael reactions to just a few different synthesis problems. So in this first one, 2244, they give us a bunch of different alpha-beta unsaturated compounds. Now notice that in these compounds, it's true, the first one they give us a ketone, so that would look really familiar. You'd have alpha and your beta, a pi bond between those two carbons, right? The carbonyl carbon, the one next to it is the alpha carbon. So these are the alpha and beta carbons. Because you have a pi, a pi bond in between those, it's alpha-beta unsaturated. And as we saw in the previous video, that means that this <clears throat> beta carbon is slightly positive because of the resonance structures that you have. And so that is an electrophile that will at attract a weak nucleophile. And so they are showing us a ketone here, and that should seem familiar, but notice that it doesn't have to be a ketone. It just has to be an alpha-beta unsaturation. Because here, what this CN is, is a cyano group, or a nitrile. So if I draw that in with the bonds, you can see how <clears throat> this carbon here would be like the alpha carbon to this almost nitrogen carbonyl type thing, and then a beta carbon. But if you think back to the mechanism, it should make sense that you would still have this phenomenon of the beta carbon being slightly positive, and therefore electrophilic, in this molecule. Because the first step in the resonance, the pi bond between atoms of differing electronegativity, is still here. And so you'd still get those resonance structures that we saw in the last video. And therefore, the beta carbon will still be slightly positive. And that happens in C2. You'll notice that you have a pi bond between atoms of differing electronegativity. That gives you that first resonance structure, which gives you the allylic positive charge that develops at what was the carbonyl carbon. And then this moves over to fill in that sinkhole of charge so that you create a positive charge on this beta carbon. So notice again, it's not about the functional group itself, it's about the pi bond between atoms of differing electronegativity, and then having alpha to that and beta to that, an unsaturation, a pi bond. And then on that beta carbon, you'll have the slight positive electrophile, slight positive charge that would attract a weak nucleophile. Okay, so given that, that, quick, uh, that quick review of what we, did we talked about last time, You'll remember that if we take a weak nucleophile and a weak carbon nucleophile, that's that, those are these Gilman reagents. So if you treat that first with, in this case, this diethyl lithium cuprate, the Gilman reagent, and you follow it by hydronium, mild acid, what you end up doing is getting the same molecule except onto the beta carbon, you add your nucleophile. And, so our nucleophile goes on the beta carbon, and you erase this pi bond. So, whenever you have these alpha-beta unsaturated compounds, and you treat them with a weak nucleophile, the weak nucleophile attaches to the beta carbon, and you erase the pi bond. And that's your product. So if you're thinking about this just from synthesis, it's pretty straightforward in that sense. So if we do the same thing here, we treat this with a Gilman reagent. So first, and the specific Gilman reagent they're giving us has ethyl groups attached to the copper and lithium. And after that, we just do an acid wash. Remember, that's to protonate our intermediate to get the enol, protonate the enolate to get the enol, so it can undergo ketoenol tautomerization, as we saw in the previous video. So when you're trying to predict a product, redraw the same exact molecule. If it helps, label the alpha and beta carbons. On the beta carbon, put whatever the weak nucleophile is. In this case, it's an ethyl group. Put that on the beta carbon. And then, erase the pi bond between the alpha and beta carbons. And that's your product. Okay. One more time, if we take this alpha-beta unsaturated compound, we know that the beta carbon is electrophilic, but it only attracts weak nucleophiles, not strong ones. A weak carbon nucleophile is a Gilman reagent. It doesn't always have to be an ethyl group. That's just what they happen to be giving us in this molecule. But it's any carbon chain. 
But if we have an ethyl group there, and then we follow it up with an acid wash, to predict the product, redraw your original molecule exactly as it is. If it helps, draw in the alpha and beta next to the carbon, so you know which is which. Remember, the alpha carbon is next to the carbonyl. The one after that is the beta carbon. Then look at your nucleophile and attach that nucleophile, an ethyl group, onto the beta carbon. That's the first thing. The second thing is erase the pi bond between the alpha and beta carbons. And that's your product. So this nucleophile attacks the electrophilic beta carbon first. You get the enolate. This protonates the enolate. And then you get ketoamine tautomerism to get your original molecule back or to get your carbonyl back. So ultimately, this is just seeing in concrete examples how a Michael reaction works. You can take a weak nucleophile and add it to the beta carbon of an alpha beta unsaturated system. Okay, this is just the same, a, 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 in exercise 2245, you have a, a similar application uh, of that, this, those same principles. We still have a weak nucleophile, or at least we will. It's not a carbon nucleophile, though. This was the other type of nucleophile that we discussed in the previous video. This alpha carbon can turn into a nucleophile. All you have to do is treat it with a base that will rip that hydrogen off. So you have a couple hydrogens here, but let's just draw one for the sake of simplicity. The potassium hydroxide, KOH, can act as a base to steal that hydrogen, the electrons go onto the alpha carbon. This is something we've seen in many reactions before. For example, in the uh, malonic ester synthesis or the acetoacetic ester synthesis, we saw this happening. So now you have a nucleophile there, but it's a weak nucleophile because the charge is spread out through resonance over all five of those atoms. You'll remember that this lone pair exists in a p orbital, and there are p orbitals on these atoms creating the pi bonds, so these, there are parallel p orbitals that allow electrons to spread out all over there. And so that stabilizes that, that lone pair, which weakens it as a nucleophile. Because it's more stable, it's less eager to react. So if you treat it with an alpha-beta unsaturated compound, like what they have here, and even if you felt stuck at the beginning of this, this alpha-beta unsaturated group is like flashing lights telling you you can do a Michael addition with this. Or potentially a stork enamine uh, synthesis, as we'll discuss in the next video. But what you know about the beta carbon, so we have the alpha carbon next to the carbonyl, and then the next one is the beta carbon. What we know about the beta carbon from the last video is that it is slightly electrophilic. It will attract weak nucleophiles, this nucleophile will attack there, and then this moves over, this moves up. So that what you get, you draw that molecule, We only have one bond to the oxygen now, which has a lone, uh, an extra lone pair. It had two before, now it has three, so it has a full negative charge. We have a pi bond here, so notice we have an enolate. And this beta carbon, so let me label that. This was the alpha carbon, this was the beta carbon. That beta carbon is going to be connected to this carbon here. So I'll draw another bond. This will be this carbon here. So we'll have two carbons on either side with the carbonyls. So notice how those are the same. And we, the new bond we've created was between this weak between that weak nucleophile and the beta carbon. Now that just explains these first two steps. We still have this hydronium. The hydronium is there to stabilize this negative charge. So the negatively charged oxygen steals one of the slightly positive hydrogens. The electrons snap back onto the oxygen there. We end up with 
really the same molecule, just with a proton on it and hydrogen on that oxygen. And then you can have the ketoenol tautomerization happen here. So, um, so what you can do is you can actually have the water that we made from the last time steal this hydrogen back, gives you back the enolate, or you can use, well, let's do it this way. If we're, since we have acid in the solution, we'll, we'll do the acid catalyzed um, keto enol tautomerization that we saw at the beginning of the chapter. So this pi bond will act as a nucleophile and attack one of these hydrogens. So we do a proton transfer there. That attaches a hydrogen on the less substituted position, and the more substituted position becomes a carbocation. This often gets a push from these lone pairs. They come down and they push these electrons there. This is a slightly positive carbon, so that would turn this lone pair into a pi bond. That will avoid the creation of a full negative charge, or a full positive charge on the carbon. The oxygen has a positive charge and the water that we made from the last step comes by to steal this hydrogen here. The electrons snap back onto the oxygen. And so you end up with the ketone. Now, overall, I'll erase that hydrogen because it's implied in that structure. Overall, what it looks like happened is you added this group onto the beta carbon and you would just erase the pi bond. So in terms of synthesis, predicting that product would have been pretty straightforward. You would just redraw this structure exactly as it is. Attach this alpha carbon the nucleophile onto it, and erase the pi bond. And so from the perspective of synthesis, that's relatively easy to predict, or at least straightforward, straightforward to predict. Just attach the nucleophile, the weak nucleophile, onto the beta carbon and erase the pi bond. But in terms of the mechanism, the base creates a weak nucleophile at that alpha carbon with two carbonyls on either side that really stabilize it through resonance. They make it a weak nucleophile so that it can attack the partially positive beta carbon of the alpha beta unsaturated ketone. Then that creates an enolate, which is stabilized by a proton transfer. With a little push from these lone pairs, the pi bond in the enol acts uh, as a, a sort of base or a nucleophile and steals a hydrogen from the acid. Then you just do one other proton transfer to get the hydrogen off of the oxygen, and so you have your product. So the actual mechanism is kind of involved, but predicting the products is more or less straightforward. And it's nice to see these together because you can see that what the essential thing that you want to recognize with these Michael additions are, is, is the fact that you need a weak nucleophile. That could either be a carbon in a Gilman reagent, or it could be an, uh, an, an alpha carbon that is alpha to two carbonyls. We'll see in the next video that that's crucial, that it's alpha to two carbonyls. One carbonyl is not enough to stabilize the negative charge to make it a weak nucleophile. It stabilizes it enough to form, but it's a strong nucleophile. And as we saw in the previous video, strong nucleophiles attack the carbonyl carbon. But in these reactions, we're trying to attack the beta carbon, and so we need a weak nucleophile.